Welcome to This Week in Linux, the Linux good news show from the Tux Digital Network. This is a podcast that keeps you up to date with what's going on in the Linux and open source world. We've got a ton of stuff this episode, so let's jump right into it. This episode of Twill is sponsored by Linbit and by Bitwarden. The Linux kernel project is at it again with yet another release. Linux 6.4 comes to us with some nice performance and hardware support improvements. Among its many changes with Linux 6.4, here are the highlights. AMD guided autonomous mode has been merged for the AMD P-State driver for use in modern Ryzen and Epic platforms. Initial Apple M2 support code has been merged. The support is still in the works overall, but there is a lot of progress with this release. Those for who can't wait for the mainline support, though, you can check out Asahi Linux, which is helping make this all happen. The DRM graphics driver code has gained a new deadline hint for helping to influence the GPU performance, state, and frequency. There's also new power features for the Steam Deck with its Van Gogh APU. Also, there's continued support for the Wi-Fi 7 functionality and much, much more. If you'd like to learn more about the latest release of the Linux kernel, link in the show notes. Red Hat is back at it again, making a change that annoys people causing some drama. To be fair, though, this time is a lot different than the first CentOS change. But not surprisingly, people are annoyed. Red Hat announced that CentOS Stream will now be the sole repository for public RHEL-related source code releases, but that Red Hat customers and partners will still have access to the source code via the Red Hat customer portal. The reason is because this changes how access to the RHEL source code is going to be delivered in the future. I won't spend too much time on this particular topic here in Twill because I already discussed this in Destination Linux, But I do want to share some additional context and information to go along with what I said in Destination Linux podcast. So if you want to learn more about my take on the the whole topic, you can check out the episodes of Destination Linux where we talk about that. And I'll have those linked in the show notes. But for some context, uh, CentOS originally was a downstream product of RHEL. Well, not product, project. Then it became an upstream project of RHEL. And now CentOS Stream is the place where source code can be acquired by the community. Previously, you could get the source code of RHEL in a different way, which was a little bit easier for clones to use. Now, RHEL clones have been around for years and years, though after the change to CentOS, new kinds of clones became a thing. These clones are the kind who attempt to be one-to-one compatible clones and promote themselves as such. There has been a saying in the business world for a long time, no one gets fired for recommending Microsoft. The idea is that back in the day, Microsoft was a safe bet for businesses. Well, Red Hat has become sort of something like this too. In these days, no one gets fired for recommending Red Hat. And the principle of this is that Red Hat provides software that people can depend on and services with support that makes executives comfortable because they know they can rely on Red Hat because Red Hat has proven this to be true for decades. Now, why am I saying this? Well, these clones are also banking on Red Hat's reputation. This is why they market themselves as compatible with RHEL. One-to-one compatible, bug-to-bug compatible, whatever. Let's not pretend that these clones would be anywhere near where they are without Red Hat. Now, I know some of you are going to say, in response to that, let's not pretend that Red Hat would be where they are without the open source projects that they are based on, right? And on the surface level, that is a fair point. But just slightly past the surface is the wonderful world of nuance, where we find the details of Red Hat existing since 1994 and spending decades and millions of dollars working on both their own stuff and contributing upstream to a seemingly endless amount of projects. Now compare that with some of the companies that are the clones and how they act is a little different. Before I expand on that, I just want to say this by no means applies to all clones. And there are many clones that have a symbiotic relationship with Red Hat. Alma Linux is a good example of a clone that symbiotically works with Red Hat to improve the platform as a whole. With that said, there are other clones that not only don't act in a symbiotic way, but actively try to be a thorn in the side of Red Hat. I'm not going to name any specific right now because the purpose of this coverage is not to start a flame war, but rather to provide information that you can use to make up your own mind on the topic. Now, like I said, 
Not all of the clones are thorns, but there are some that don't contribute back, add no value to the ecosystem, while at the same time promote themselves as better than Red Hat, like marketing themselves as the better option, all the while being completely dependent on Red Hat to even exist pretty much in every way. It's a weird approach to open source because these projects just take and take and don't seem to think that they need to give back at all. Now, open source works because the idea is to give and take, with give being the most important part of that. Some of the companies care only about the taking portion. And if it was I was in Red Hat's shoes, then I might have done something similar. I wouldn't have handled the first CentOS change like they did at all. But this one, I mean, I get it. So with Red Hat having rebuilds like this, why would anyone be surprised that this kind of thing might happen? If you want to know more about this whole situation as well as my in-depth take on the subject, such as the difference for why this change is more of a loophole than a violation of the GPL, and my take on the ethics of it all, then check out Destination Linux and I'll have links in the show notes for all of that. In other enterprise Linux news, and this time with some rather amusing news, SUSE has released new parody songs. For those that don't know, SUSE releases parody songs, on occasion, that celebrates Linux and open source or talks about how good their software is. There's nothing wrong with this idea, and in fact, sometimes they stumble upon gold. Although most of the time, these parodies are in the category that they're so bad that they become kind of awesome. <laughs> This batch has some of those. For example, the Led Zeppelin parody is a very, very fun one. Now, I do have a bit of a critique, though, that I hope Sousa will take into consideration. You see, the Sousa Safe and Sound is a parody of a Taylor Swift song. Having never heard the Swift version before, I was a bit thrown by the sad and arguably depressing vibe of the song. I mean, the song is saying things about keeping the data safe and systems running and whatnot. However, the vibe is sad, depressing, and maybe even slightly a bit haunting. So what's up with that, Sousa? I decided to put my news reporter hat on and dig into this a bit. I found that the Taylor Swift song is from the movie franchise Hunger Games. The song is about one character trying to soothe their little sister who is scared and telling them that everything is going to be all right while at the same time knowing that that is probably not true. So, Susa, are you saying that the data is going to be all right while knowing that that's probably not true? Okay, so I obviously say that as a joke, but honestly, the vibe of that song is a bit weird for the Susa version. I recommend sticking to upbeat and positive-sounding songs to parody so that at least the message has a meeting with the vibe. So, I mean, Uptime Funk is gold. Like I was talking about, you have stumbled on gold, and Uptime Funk is one of those. And Sousa Yes Please is very good. And Walk Like a Chameleon has such a fun vibe that it's hard to not enjoy it, even though it's kind of weird. But there are some, like, are a swing and a miss, like that one, and the 25 Years one. Though I guess that it's better to swing and a miss than never swinging in the first place, so... Okay, you know what? Never mind. Keep doing whatever you want. <laughs> and for those who are interested in checking out these parodies, I'll provide a link to their playlist in the show notes and also a few that I like as well. This episode of Twill is brought to you by Linbit. Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over 20 years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD, which is high availability software that has been part of the Linux kernel since 2010 and Linstore, industry-leading open-source software-defined storage. Linbit has an active presence in the open-source community as well because they collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features to their products. Linbit provides enterprise-grade software that runs on a variety of platforms without vendor lock-in, which is really cool because no matter what your OS is and no matter what kind of hardware you want to use, including off-the-shelf hardware, you're good to go with DRBD and Linstore. And also with DRBD and Linstore, you can have high-speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration, whether it's Kubernetes, Apache Cloud, or Open Nebula. There's even DRBD proxy for long-distance replication. L Linbit provides really awesome services like DRBD 
And DRBD is a really good way to make sure you have good data recovery and backups. And if you ever have like a cluster with multiple nodes and one of those nodes fails, you can have rest assurance that the backup nodes will have the data that you want. So if you're interested in checking out any of the software from Linbit, I highly recommend it. So go to linbit.com to check it out. That's L-I-N-B-I-T dot com. System76 have recently launched a new product from their in-house manufacturing efforts. This time, it is a custom PC case based on their Thelio desktops. The Thelios are really nice looking. The design is pretty slick, and a lot of people have been wanting to get their hands on the case, but at the same time prefer to build their computers themselves. This is exactly where the Nebula comes in, and there are three different size options to choose from. The Nebula 19, which is $199, supports Mini ITX, Nebula 36, which is 269, supports Mini ITX, Micro ATX, and ATX, and the Nebula 49, which comes in at $329 and supports ATX and EATX. Each of these case options are compatible with the accent panels from the Thelio line, so you can customize the case to fit your style. System76 says that repairability is an important consideration for this case, and so they were designed for easy access to all components, even equipped with a removable lid for quick access from multiple angles. Plenty of room for GPUs are, is available in the 19, fitting up to 272.3 millimeters. The 36 has up to 312 millimeters and the 49 has up to 390.5 millimeters. So the Nebula 49 case should be large enough for practically any GPU with room for more. With this being a specifically designed case, there's some extras that you can get for it too. System76 offers an upgrade where you can get their CPU coolers, additional GPU intake fans, and a SATA backplane for drive hot swapping. One of the coolest things about the Thelio is the cooling and airflow system that they designed into the case. The Nebula line features that same specifically designed cooling. My Destination Linux cohort, Ryan, reviewed the Thelio and suggested some improvements for the case design, and it's awesome to see that System76 implemented those changes in these Nebula cases. I think this is going to be a very tempting product from System76 because finding the right case for the right configuration is pretty difficult, and having a really custom one also made from a Linux company is really awesome to see. So if you want to check this out, you'll find links in the show notes. The Steam Summer Sale for 2023 is currently live right now, so you're welcome for the news, and I'm also sorry for your wallets. This year, not only are a bunch of cool games on sale during the event, but also you can get access to discounts on Valve's Steam Deck console. The 64GB model has 10% off, the 256GB model has 15% off, and the 512 model comes with 20% off, plus the Steam Deck docking station is also on sale with 20% off. Valve also put up a special page for the top 100 games compatible with the Steam Deck, so you can easily scroll down through a nice list with discounts and deck verified ratings. For those looking for games on sale, you can get a discount on Hogwarts Legacy, Valheim, Dead by Daylight, The Witcher 3, Stray, Spider-Man Remastered, and of course, many, many more. Again, I'm sorry, and you're welcome. Links in the show notes. Recently, we saw a new release from the team over at Xenotic. For those unfamiliar, Xenotic is an addictive arena-style first-person shooter and is one of the leading open-source video games. Xenotic has distinctive weapons, lots of game modes, unique maps and arenas, customizable heads-up display or HUD, and much, much more. Xenotic 0.8.6 was released, and this features new maps, performance optimizations, new AI superbots, improved visuals, improved HUD, new scoreboard UI, and even more. Xenotic is a really cool and really fun game that I have enjoyed for many years now, but I do have one tiny critique to share. Xenotic has been around for almost 12 years. It's time to drop that leading zero and release a 1.0 for the game. <laughs> In fact, that just dropped a leading zero anyway and call it 8.6. That's fine too. A leading zero suggests that software is unreleased in the pre-production stage, so I think it's time. Anyway, if you'd like to check out Xenotic, link in the show notes. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com tux. 
Bitwarden is an awesome piece of software. It is a password manager that allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. How does it do it? Well, Bitwarden provides you with tools that allow you to store your passwords in a secured vault, auto-generate those passwords and passphrases and usernames, and even automatically fill in all of that stuff into login forms so you don't have to do any of this stuff. Plus, you can access your data across many different types of devices, like your web browser, your mobile apps, desktop applications, and even on the command line. Plus, Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end -end encryption before it ever leaves your devices so you know you're the only one with access to your data, which is, of course, very important when we're talking about passwords. So go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started. Did I mention? You can get started for free. Well, you can, but I think you want to check out their premium account because for less than a dollar per month, that's right, less than a dollar per month, you get access to one gigabyte encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator for temporary one-time passwords, and so much more, including priority customer support. So make the smart move like many of the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash tux. That's bitwarden.com slash T-U-X. Proxmox has announced a new version for both their virtual environment and their backup server products. Proxmox Virtual Environment 8.0 is based on Debian 12, but it is using a newer Linux kernel with Linux 6.2. It also comes with QEMU 8.0.2 and LXC 5.0.2. In addition to the virtual environment, Proxmox Backup Server 3.0, which shares the same base as Proxmox VE, and but it also adds many improvements for tape handling and various bug fixes. If you'd like to learn more, you can find links in the show notes. Next up in Twill, we're going to cover a couple of Fedora derivatives. First up, Rizzy OS. For the uninitiated, Rizzy OS is a Fedora-based Linux distribution which runs the GNOME desktop environment and includes a number of graphical setup and tweak tools. Some of the modern features Rizzy OS inherits from R Fedora specifically include ButterFS, Whalen, even on NVIDIA hardware, Pipewire, and much more. So let's talk about the improvements available in Rizzy OS 38. One of the most prominent features of Rizzy OS 38 is the first boot experience. They reimagined the quick setup tool, making it easier and more efficient to set up and get up and running with your Rizzy OS system. In fact, this tool helps you to easily set up third-party drivers and repositories, as well as install applications. Additionally, Rizzy OS 38 features a complete redesign of the Rizzy Welcome tool. And the Rizzy Tweaks tool has undergone a complete redesign, including a new UI giving it a brand new look and feel. They have also moved the extensions tool from Rizzy Tweaks to GNOME's extension tool instead to improve the stability and overall experience for the user. Rizzy OS also features the R theme tool and with Rizzy OS 38 comes with R-Theme 1.0. The API for R-Theme has made it to production state with significant improvements to GNOME shell support and the plugin system. This tool allows users to recolor their GNOME desktop, giving them more control over the look and feel of their system in a post lib at weta GNOME. These are just a few of the highlights of Rizzy OS 38. And if you'd like to learn more about it, you can check out the links in the show notes. The other Fedora-based Linux distro we're going to cover this week is called Nobara. Nobara 38 has been released, and for those unfamiliar, the Nobara project is a modified version of the Fedora Linux distro with user-friendly fixes added to it. Fedora is a very good workstation distro, however, anything involving like third-party products and proprietary packages and stuff like that are typically absent from Fedora. Now, a typical point-and-click user can often struggle with how to get things working, so some of the important things that Nomara makes easier is for users to get wine dependencies, third-party codec packages, such as the stuff for GStreamer, third-party drivers, such as NVIDIA drivers, and more. Nobara 38 also includes specific features for improvements to DaVinci Resolve, GStreamer codecs, and improved support for Xbox controllers. The Linux gamers out there might also be interested in Nobara because the lead developer behind it goes by the username Glorious Eggroll. If you'd like to learn more about this release, you can check out the links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you'd like what I do here on this show and want to be kept up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, then be sure to subscribe. And of course, remember to like that smash button. If you'd like to support the show and the Tux Digital Network, then be consider becoming a patron by going to tuxdigital.com membership. 
This is where you can get a bunch of cool perks like access to patron only sections of the Discord server and much, much more. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt that I'm currently wearing right now by going to tuxdigital.com slash store. Plus, while you're there, check out all the other cool stuff that we have like hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, coasters, and so much more at tuxdigital.com slash store. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Your Source for Linux. Good news.